Good morning, Vineyard Church Glendora. My friends, I am excited to be with you this morning. My name is Karen Rugley, and I am on the teaching team here at VCG. It's good to see all of the updates that are happening in the chat. And while I wish we were giving these updates to each other in our cafe, in person, peeling hard boiled eggs and sneaking our kiddos one too many donut holes, I am so thankful that we have been able to stay connected to one another on Sunday mornings. You know, I am reminded of Ephesians 2 verses 7 through 10, and I love the way that Eugene Peterson says this in the message translation. It reads, now God has us right where God wants us with all the time in this world and the next to shower grace and kindness upon us in Christ Jesus. Saving is all God's idea and all God's work. All we do is trust God enough to let God do it. It's God's gift from start to finish. We don't play the major role. If we did, we'd probably go around bragging that we had done the whole thing. No, we neither make nor save ourselves. God does both the making and the saving. God creates each of us by Christ Jesus to join him in the work he does, the good work God has gotten us ready to do, work we had better be doing. You know, amidst all that we have going on around us, I take heart in the fact that God has us right where God wants us. And God is getting us ready for the work that we are to be doing. And so on that note, I have something incredible I want to share with you because God is getting us ready for the work that we are to be doing. One month from today, April 4th, Easter Sunday, we will be having our first indoor, in-person worship service. Oh, We simply cannot wait to be back together again. I can't wait to sit next to you and to sing next to you, to be in your presence and worship Jesus, rubbing shoulder to shoulder with you, my community. You know, we're going to be sending out more details in the upcoming weeks, but I want you to know now, due to indoor gathering restrictions, we're going to be hosting three morning services, 8.30 a.m., 10, and 11.30 We will be asking you to register for the service that you want to attend, but we will air it online at 10 a.m. These are gonna be friends and family welcome services, so you are welcome to come with your friends and your family before or stay after for outdoor fellowship and food. If you do plan to bring others, which we really want you to, you're probably gonna want to get registered early. Again, we will be sending out all of the details this week. And you know, if you are new to this space, our virtual space, we want you to come back to worship with us at Easter. Click on the I'm new button so that we can get to know you a little bit more. And if you want the details on our Easter gathering, as well as all of the many things we have going on throughout the week for community and for connection, For all our adults, our youth, our kids, make sure that you email us at info at vineyardglendora.com and we will get you all the information you need shortly. If you need more connection today even, we will have a virtual cafe for fellowship and for discussion after our online service. You can click on the virtual cafe form link and we will send you the Zoom link through your email now. You know, as we turn our attention to the next portion of our online service, I would love for us to just take a quick second and center our hearts and minds on Jesus. I don't know about you, but this week for me and for our family has been running from thing to thing to thing without like leaving my house. So I often come into these spaces on Sunday mornings really missing each of you, but honestly, I need a second. I need a second to transition my heart and my mind to this space. So I take a deep breath alongside each of you so that we can mentally, spiritually tune our our hearts and our ears to what God is doing. 
if you need some more support in that transition of attuning your attention, we have a team of people who are ready to pray with you right now. If you've had a busy week and you need to just offload some of that info and some of that energy onto others, please, we will be more than happy to pray with you. But right now, we invite you to take a deep breath and center your heart on what God is going to be doing in our service today. Your love, oh Lord, strength to my soul, hope for tomorrow, it won't let go. Your presence is joy to my life, to you I lift my eyes. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord, we will sing of your love forevermore. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord, serve the Lord. Let's go. Your word alone, the lamp to my feet, a light to my path as you leading me. Your ways, O oh Lord, are higher than mine. To you I lift my eyes. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. We will sing of your love forevermore. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord, serve the Lord, Lord, serve you, God. Open up every door, writing on every wall, singing in every Open up every door, writing on every wall, singing in every room. Open up every door, writing on every wall, singing in every room. Open up every door, writing on every wall. Singing in every room. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. We will sing of your love forevermore. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Serve the Lord. know, as we continue with our worship, I just have this thought um, today. You know that worship is a choice. We have to make a choice. Like day after day, when we wake up or even if it's as we leave our house, we have to make a choice between serving God or be just be overwhelmed by the things that are going on around us right now. And that will like bring fear in our lives, bring regret. But if we fix our eyes to God, to Jesus, and just say that, God, I will serve you today. I will choose to serve you today. And that will bring peace in our hearts. 
and our souls will be satisfied. And that too um, begins in our house, just declaring um, that we, as a family, we will serve the Lord no matter what. No matter what comes in in our lives, we will choose to serve the Lord. So let's do this. If you are near to your kids or if your kids are around right now, go and gather them. Um, if you are right beside your loved ones or your friends or your wife, or your husband, just reach out to them right now. Just lay, lay your hands upon them and just uh, whisper a simple prayer and just uh, proclaim that um, as a family, we will serve the Lord. And that you can end your prayer with that too. Say, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And also, I like that part of the song. It says, open up every door, write it on every wall, sing it in every room. If you have a chance also right now, you can go you know, in your house, in every room, and just declare the presence of God. I know uh, sooner we'll be opening our house, or even the church, and to our friends. And my prayer is, as we as we do that, even as they enter our very room, our very house, they will feel the presence of God. And then that they will also choose like to, to, to obey the Lord and serve Him. So let's do that. Go ahead and, and, and pray. And if you're done, maybe you can put a heart emoji in there. <laughs> Just a sign for me to know that you know, we can move on and with our worship. Let's do that. Let's take a moment just to bless our kids, bless our family even pray for our home. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. We will serve you, Lord, and open our doors to you, right in on our hearts. Forevermore, as for me in my house, 
we will serve the Lord, serve the Lord. Yes, God, we will serve you. We will worship you, God. Thank you, Jesus. God, we acknowledge your presence here in our midst, in our house. And Lord, um, I ask, Lord, that you would speak to us right now, Jesus. Just move in deep into our hearts, Lord. Let your love just, uh, Lord, just penetrate deep within. Let us be filled with you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord. No. 
I'm Rick Larson, and I'm here to share the scripture with you this morning. It's from Matthew 5, 38 through 42. You've heard it was said, eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek also. And if anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, hand over your coat as well. If anyone forces you to go one mile, Go with them two miles. Give to the one who asks you and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. Well, hey everybody, so great to be with you again this morning. You know, if you were with us last fall, you may remember that, that we spent, I don't know, around three months doing a bit of reimagining. We talked extensively about reimagining the church within the, the context of the times in which we find ourselves. And little did we know that our reimagining work, it was only just beginning. Because back in January, we started reading and teaching through Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, which is basically one large act of reimagination. Because it's here that we're confronted with, with the way that Jesus reimagines the world. And we're invited into this brand new alternative reality where the church becomes a new alternative community that reflects Jesus' values and Jesus' kingdom. Which suggests that Maybe some of the ways of thinking and maybe some of the ways of living that we've accepted as reality, as normal, as just the way the world works, maybe those need to be seriously challenged or rethought. And I'll be honest, this, this can be difficult. This can be disorienting because the world that Jesus reimagines, it's a fairly crazy, upside-down sort of world that runs counter to so many of the presuppositions and the stories that we tell ourselves. It's a world where... Some of our old, rigid ways of thinking are suspended and superseded and transcended by something far more compelling and far more life-giving. Because I guarantee you, when Jesus said the things we just heard him say in his day, it raised more than a few eyebrows. It caused a great deal of disruption and tension. And so if we still find ourselves a bit unsettled, a bit shaken by what Jesus says, imagining he couldn't really have meant that, well, this just may reveal how enmeshed we are within the conventional wisdom and the reality of life as we know it today as well. And so what is Jesus saying here? And, and why was it such an act of radical reimagination? Well, he starts in this section 
once again, by referencing a few well-known portions of the Torah or the, the law that speak to justice and how it was carried out within the context of ancient Israel. He says in chapter 5, verse 38, You have heard it was said, eye for eye and tooth for tooth. Now here, Jesus is citing a common refrain referenced in passages such as Exodus 21, uh, Leviticus 24, and Deuteronomy 19. I mean, this is what the Torah said. This is how justice within ancient Israel was to be dispensed. It, and it seems to suggest that retribution of some sort was required. Uh, this is where we get the idea of lex talionis, or the law of retribution. Essentially, the idea that, that punishments, they're to be equal to the crime. Now, in its day and time, this eye for eye and tooth for tooth it was actually another highly progressive piece of legislation that served to limit violence in a fairly barbaric and primitive culture, devoid of a modern judicial system. It actually served to limit the extent to which someone could retaliate. The, the retaliation had to match the severity of the fence, you see, S such that if someone like stole one of your goats, you, you might take one of their goats in response, but you weren't permitted to like physically maim the person. So think of it as like no more than an eye for an eye or a tooth for a tooth. The intent was to mitigate retaliatory violence, to make sure that revenge didn't run away with itself uncontrolled and unchecked. But that said, let's, let's not lose the presupposition or just the way the world worked. The assumption was that there would be some sort of violent response or some sort of retaliation, right? And that presupposition, it's not just 3,500 years old, is it? It's still very much the way the world works. You take from us, we take from you. You strike us, we strike you. You bomb us, we bomb you. I mean, think of every geopolitical conflict over the course of just, I don't know, the last 50 years, whether it's Israel and Palestine, the Hutus and Tutsis in Rwanda in the 90s, the Iraqis and the Kurds, Catholics and Protestants in Northern Ireland, and the list goes on and on and on, doesn't it? It's like seemingly endless. And what we get is basically an unending cycle or like a vortex of violence that our world has never been able to find a way to pull itself out of, which means that Maybe we need a bigger imagination. Maybe we need some different alternatives because the ones we continue to try for literally thousands of years have never worked. And so in steps Jesus with, but I tell you, do not resist an evil person. Or another translation that I like, don't use violence to resist evil. And then he gives us three scenarios for how this might play itself out in the real world, which is always really helpful, right? Because Jesus essentially goes, one better than the Torah. It's like, rather than just making sure vengeance doesn't run away unchecked, Jesus proposes, what if we had no vengeance at all? What if we found a more creative and redemptive way forward that actually reflected the patient love of God? In essence, what if we refuse to play that game? The you hit me and then I hit you violent resistance and retribution game that the world has played for thousands of years. And in doing so, what if we challenged the powers of domination and violence by, by exposing them for what they are? Now that would be interesting. And let me tell you, that would be revolutionary and transformative. I dare say it would change the world. How so? Well, Let's look at Jesus' three examples real quick, and then I'll give you a more recent historical example, and then we'll literally flesh this out. First, Jesus says, If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other also. Now let me say from the beginning that in each of the three scenarios Jesus references, he is in no way promoting passive non-resistance. He's not promoting just allowing people to abuse you. No. What we'll see in each is a powerful, active act of nonviolent resistance to evil. Resistance that subverts the law of retaliation and sets us free from some of our presuppositions that are literally killing us. And so Jesus famously instructs his followers not to strike back, but to turn the other cheek. Now, you have to appreciate how hilarious this must have sounded, how utterly foolish, how counterintuitive this must have been. 
Jesus is literally playing the fool here, waxing comedic in his day, and maybe still in ours. Because in Jesus' day, a slap on the right cheek suggested a backhanded slap with one's right hand. I mean, this was an act of humiliation. It was a, a way of keeping someone down or putting someone in their place. It's what masters did to slaves, what husbands sometimes did to wives. It was a violent act of power and domination. And so in Jesus' day, turning the other cheek, it wasn't a way to let someone walk over you. It was, it was just the opposite. It was, it was a way to say, you know what? You can strike me on the left cheek, with your open palm, but when you hit me again, you will only hit me as one of your equals, not as an inferior. Because hitting back only recirculates the violence. And so Jesus tells his followers to challenge the whole system, the whole social order, and the whole way of thinking with a powerful act of nonviolence. Now, scenario number two, he says, and if anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, hand over your coat as well. Now, again, I think it's hard for us to appreciate the, the first century Palestinian humor at play here, as most of us have never been sued for our shirt nor our coat. And, and even if we were, we'd likely have plenty more at home, and so like, no big deal, right? But for Jesus' original audience, their shirt and their coat was likely all they had in terms of clothing. Traditional apparel at this time generally consisted of an outer and an undergarment, Think of it as like underwear and a robe. And so in the picture Jesus paints, a poor person who is told to turn over their undergarment is encouraged by Jesus to give them their outer garment as well, leaving them, well, you get the picture, right? Now, if a person followed through with this bold, albeit chilly, act of nonviolent resistance, they were actually making quite a statement, weren't they? I mean, they were exposing, pun fully intended, the economic and the, and the justice system for what it was, always benefiting the rich and the powerful at the expense of the poor. And so in a very real way, they were speaking truth to power. They were fighting back. Now, the third and final scenario of utter foolishness and hilarity centers around a Roman law that allowed soldiers in Palestine to force subjects to carry their packs. Now, apparently, some of the soldiers abused this law, which led uh, to the institution of what we'll call the one-and-done law. A subject could only be forced to go one mile, but no more. And so Jesus says, if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. Can you picture the scene? The Roman soldier, the sworn enemy is like, okay, that's a mile. You, you can put it down. Be on your way. The follower of Jesus. Actually, you know what? I got some time. I'm feeling it today. I'm I'm good for another mile. Let's get her done. Roman soldier. No, no, that's actually against the law. If you do and, and I get caught, I, I may get in trouble. Even flogged, I don't know. So just put the pack down. Follower of Jesus. No, no, I, I insist on blessing you. One more mile, my treat. Do you see what you've done? You've thrown a wrench into the whole imperial machine. It grinds to a halt, even if it's just in this one isolated incident. And you open up the possibility for an unexpected act of love and redemption. I mean, your decision to be generous, rather than, than to sit around and plot your revenge, it's a reflection of the God that you're called to imitate. And who knows? Who knows what conversations may occur during that second unexpected mile? If nothing else, you have just modeled for your sworn enemy an entirely new way to be human. Because remember, this is what Jesus has been showing us throughout this entire sermon. He has shown us what it looks like when our only aim, our highest ethic, is to love others really, really well by reflecting the love of God. There is such power in this, you see. It challenges our presuppositions. It sets our imaginations free to seek crazy, upside-down, alternative ways to promote true justice and equity in all things, to resist evil, and to do so in nonviolent, redemptive ways. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the uh, outspoken Lutheran pastor and theologian, the anti-Nazi dissident, once wrote this about resisting the unthinkable evil that came out of that era. He wrote, Evil will become powerless when it finds no opposing object, no resistance, but instead is willingly born and suffered. 
Evil meets an opponent for which it is not a match. And this is exactly what we see in the way of Jesus. There is no match. Evil is rendered powerless as it is born and suffered. So how on earth do we become the kinds of people that actually live this out? Who live this way? Because I recognize this, this can be fairly idealistic, can't it? I mean, some of us may even be shaking our heads right now thinking, utter foolishness. That's just not how the real world works. In the real world, there is real evil, and there is real hatred and injustice and bigotry. In the real world, there is real violence, and it demands a response. And so how do we keep the fists or the texts from flying? How do we keep from, from lashing out, from hitting back, from retaliating, from giving them what they may justly deserve? I tell you, we need examples. We need icons. We need to see it in the flesh, don't we? In 1956, Martin Luther King Jr. was a young 20-something Baptist preacher in Montgomery, Alabama. And there he quite unexpectedly found himself as the leader of the bus boycotts that began when Rosa Parks refused to give up her seat. And as it progressed, he started hearing rumors that, that, that the white authorities in Montgomery, they wanted to get rid of him. Now, you probably don't have to be reminded that to be a young black man in Montgomery, Alabama in 1956 and to find out that some people wanted to get rid of you, that was not good news. Well, the rumors came to a head on the night of January 27, 1956. King was asleep in his small home with his young wife and two-month-old baby girl when he was jolted awake in the middle of the night by a phone call. The essence of the call and the message of the caller was that if he was not out of town in three days, they were going to kill him and bomb his house. King hung up the phone, and, but he was so disturbed by what the caller said that he just couldn't go back to bed. So he poured himself a cup of coffee, sat down at his kitchen table. He thought about his wife sleeping in the bedroom down the hall, about his two-month-old baby girl also sleeping soundly. And in his words, he said, he was absolutely paralyzed by fear. He said he had never been so afraid in his whole life. He said that all he could think about was, how am I going to get out of this? How am I going to save and protect my family? Absolutely overcome by, by fear. You know, I think many of us can perhaps relate when we think about how we would respond to such evil, such a blatant and violent physical threat. And conventional wisdom would tell us that in moments like this, we got to pull back. we got to protect what is ours. Thoughts of how do I get out of this? Those would be natural and expected. And in moments like this, when we're frozen or paralyzed by fear, this teaching from Jesus sounds insane. It makes no sense whatsoever. I mean, turn the other cheek, walk a second mile with my sworn enemy, do good to those who just threatened me and my family. And this is at least what, what King was wrestling with that night over his cup of coffee because, you know, King was a preacher and he knew his Bible. And, and yet that night, those teachings made no sense. He just needed a way out. And then something happened, something unexpected. And it changed the course of King's life that night. And the case can be made that what happened that night over a cup of coffee changed the course of American history. Because as he was sitting there with his hands in his face, confessing his fears and his anxieties to God, King said that he felt a stirring in his soul that he had never felt before. And then he said that he heard an inner voice and that this inner voice said, stand up for righteousness. Stand up for justice. Stand up for truth. And lo, I will be with you even to the end of the world. He said the voice promised to never, ever leave him. Never, never to leave him alone. And in that moment and in that hour when darkness reigned, King had a supernatural encounter with the living presence of God. He said it was like nothing he had ever experienced before in his entire life. And he said, and I quote, at that moment, I knew I could stand up without fear. I could face anything. What radically changed Martin Luther King Jr. was an inexplicable sense that God was with him, that God was near to him. And it changed everything, his outlook, his mission, everything. And I'll tell you what. This is the key to understanding what Jesus is saying to us today through this teaching. 
And if we don't get this, yeah, I know, it doesn't really make much sense. This has been the message of the Sermon on the Mount from the very beginning, that God is with you, that God is near you. And so when you're awake at 2 a.m., paralyzed with fear, God is with you. Whatever injustice or threat you are facing, God is with you. And when you truly believe that, it changes the way you see literally everything. I think for some of us, our core problem with this radical teaching, it's not that we think it's just absurd, but that we don't see the kind of world that Jesus sees or that Jesus imagines. We see a world of injustice and anger and violence where everything is in short supply, where life is fragile. But Jesus saw a world where where God was in control, and justice was guaranteed, where goodness was breaking forth, and, and where life itself was without end. And if you see life that way, then what Jesus says here makes perfect sense. Just four days after Martin Luther King Jr.'s late night cup of coffee, his experience with God, his new vision of the world, it was put to the test. Because he was speaking at a rally for the bus boycott when around 9 p.m., a young man ran into the service announcing that King's house had just been bombed, the house where his wife and his two-month-old daughter were staying. So King immediately ran home and, and he found his house still on fire. Police and fire officials were there, along with a large, angry mob of black citizens from Montgomery standing around the house with guns, rifles, and baseball bats ready to riot. And once King found that his family was safe, he he walked up to the porch of his still-burning house that had just been firebombed by the Klan. Here's actually a photo of that moment. And King looked out on the angry crowd of black citizens ready to riot, and he did what he was born to do. He preached a sermon. Listen to what he said that night to the crowd gathered there. He said this, I want you to love your enemies. Be good to them. Love them and let them know you love them. What we are doing is right. What we are doing is just. And God is with us. So go home with this glowing faith, with this radiant assurance, with love in our hearts, with faith and with God in front of We cannot lose. And then this angry mob put down their guns and their bats, and they spontaneously broke into amazing grace. They sang, they cried, they hugged, and they peacefully went back to their homes. How do you explain such a response, such a transformation? How do you explain this this kind of change, this shift in posture? Only this, the presence of God and a deep abiding sense that God is with you. How do we turn the other cheek? How do we bless those who would do us harm? This is the only way I know how. Because you see, the Sermon on the Mount and Jesus' teaching here is the blueprint for the life he lived. Which means it's also the blueprint for how God chose to be with us. This isn't about us just learning how to behave in some really hard and difficult situations where we occasionally get it right. This is about discovering the living God in the loving and dying Jesus. And then it's about learning how to reflect that love in a violent world that needs it so, so badly. Abigail will take it from here. Well, hello, dear ones. It's so good to be in this space with you today. So from wherever you are right now, however you come, I want to welcome you into a time of communion. But before we partake with one another, allow me to offer that that what we find throughout the Gospels and here in this particular portion of the Sermon on the Mount is that Jesus is asking nothing of his followers that he hasn't actually already faced and experienced for himself. I mean, Jesus is, is always going before us, always showing us the way forward, right? And you know, the church is in this season that we call Lent right now. And it's just a time to slow down and create space just to engage the death and the resurrection of Jesus. And when we think about how Jesus faced and, and experienced the worst kinds of hatred, the worst kinds of injustice, the worst kinds of violence, all directed at him, we find that, that when they mocked him, he remained silent. 
when, when they challenged him, he actually told these funny kind of upside down stories that just challenged traditional boxes that people were stuck in. And, and when they struck him in the face with their fist, he, he took the pain and then he embodied it. And when they did their absolute worst to him by, by putting a Roman instrument of death on his back, he, he carried it to his own place of execution as an unclean outsider, as a shamed criminal, as one of them. And when they nailed him then to that cross and he hung naked and exposed, he actually prayed and he forgave them. Friends, this is why the communion table that we, that we often gather around in which we're going to close this service around, it's so important because it quite literally challenges and expands our imagination as, as it just breaks the destructive cycles of revenge that just take us further and further away from God's kingdom. I mean, it's this continual reminder to us of how God himself deals with injustice and violence. And he, he does it by absorbing it and bearing it away. It's amazing. And so at this table, God shows us that God is with us. At this table, God shows us that God would go a million miles and a million miles more to make it right with us. God shows us that that evil has become powerless because it is willingly born and suffered. And God shows us that evil has met an opponent for which there is no match. Amen. You know, as Jesus ate and drank on his final night with his followers, he, he was turning the world upside down. And he was just inviting his followers to come and do the same. The communion table that night was, was where the work of reimagining was let loose. And maybe it was a feast of fools. And if so, may we be so foolish as to embrace it as the best hope of a world that we know is still stuck in a vortex that's bent on violence and revenge. Because communing from this table, feasting from this humble act of grace and humility, friends, it's our best act of resisting evil. So may the broken body and poured out blood blood of the lamb, may it lead us forward. If you don't already have bread and cup prepared for you yet, go ahead and and grab a cracker or a piece of bread. Grab some wine or juice from your fridge. I want to lead us through a time of communion as we ask Jesus to lead us and be with us right here and right now. But before we partake together, let's go ahead and take a moment just to prepare our hearts for the sacrifice and the grace of Jesus to be released in our lives. And let's take a moment to simply ask, is there any way in me that is disconnected to the way of Jesus? Is there anything that I am putting before my call to follow in the humble and sacrificial way of Jesus? Is there something that I have prioritized that is not the priority or the agenda of the kingdom? Take a moment to ask for the gentle nudge of the Holy Spirit to reveal this and then ask for forgiveness. Before we eat the bread, will you pray with me? Holy Spirit, as we now partake of your broken body, may we be reminded that you are the bread of life. You are the one who sustains and nourishes our souls. And you are the one who gives us the strength that we need to walk in your ways and to carry out your plans and your purposes of peace in us. Amen. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took the bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Now will you pray with me as we receive the blood that was shed for us. Holy Spirit, now as we drink from the cup, may we be reminded that you are the one who has set the oppressed free, that you are the one who has released us from the power of sin and guilt and shame. So to you, God, we give you all of the glory. Amen. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Amen.
Amen. I love to leave you with a benediction that comes from Hebrews chapter 13, verse 20. It says, Now may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead of our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will. And may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. Friends, may you walk forth in freedom and peace and grace today. Amen. Well, friends, that's it. Thanks again for joining us today for our virtual service. Don't forget that we want to connect with you throughout the week, not just on Sunday mornings. Email our church office and we will get back to you with ways to engage with all that God is doing here at Vineyard Church Glendora. Also, if you have kids or if you are just a kid at heart, make sure you stay tuned or call those kids in the room now because it is time for our Y2K service. Y2K. This, I'll tell you, is quickly becoming the highlight of my week. I love the messages, the jokes, and honestly, the worship dancing of Megan and Alex. I am here for that. If you have never watched, make sure you stay all the way to the end of that Y2K service because the bloopers are awesome. If you need prayer before you go, you are more than welcome to hang back and receive it through the live prayer button. Otherwise, as Paul reminds us in Ephesians, friends, let's get going this week on the work that God has set before us. Grace and peace to you. Hey guys, and, and welcome, welcome to, to Y2K. Y2K. This is our youth to kids service. We are so excited that you guys are here today. We're gonna to be doing amazing things. ZJ is gonna be doing the message today and it's gonna be incredible. Um, before we jump into everything, we first need to do some announcements. So Megan, what's going on with Vineyard Kids this week? This month in Vineyard Kids, we have our um, art and hangout time. It is going to be on March 14th, so not this Sunday, but next Sunday. We will be hanging out, doing some art. It's really fun. The Zoom link is in your parents' emails. Invite your friends. It's going to be so much fun, and I hope to see you there. 
Also, for Vineyard Youth, we are doing a Roblox video game night, and this is what's going to be with middle schoolers, and it's going to be Friday, March 12th, and this is going to be 7 to 8 p.m. So come hang out with us. It's going to be awesome for guys and girls. Love to see you guys there. Also, for middle school and high school, we're meeting in person um, and online, so we're just switching off every week, but we're going to try to make as much in-person meetings as we can because it's getting warmer out and we just need to be in person again. So, um, can't wait to see you guys at those events and I think that's about it. That's all. Yeah. Should we get over to worship? I think we should do jokes next because that's oh, the next thing. Yeah, right. <laughs> and then we'll get to worship. Awesome guys. Well, let's get to the jokes. and welcome back to Jokes with Isabel. Joining me today is my good friend, Stitch. Me and Stitch will be telling funny jokes today. Today we will be telling St. Patrick's Day jokes, even though St. Patrick's Day is in a week or two, I don't know, but wear your green because I've heard that leprechauns come early and Stitch, you're not wearing any green. Here, just wear this blanket. Okay, now he's good. I'm wearing green. Or almost stripping. Oh well. Now, on to the jokes. Why did the leprechaun climb over the rainbow? You know? No? Well, obviously to get the pot of gold. <laughs> Why did the leprechaun turn down a bowl of soup? Because he already had a pot of gold. <laughs> what is a leprechaun's favorite cereal? Lucky Charms. What happens if you cross poison ivy and a four-leaf clover? You get a rash of good luck. <laughs> How is a good friend like a four-leaf clover? They're hard to find. Isn't that right, Stitch? Why do people wear shamrocks on St. Patrick's Day? Because regular rocks are too heavy. Unless you're Hercules. <laughs> <laughs> knock knock. Say who's there. Who's there? Warren. Warren who? Warren anything green for St. Patrick's Day? Knock knock. Who's there? Irish. Irish who? I wish you happy St. Patrick's Day. <laughs> and I wish you a happy St. Patrick's Day, too. Well, that is all for today. See you next week. Or maybe the week after that. Or the week after that. Or some, some other day. With jokes from Isabel. See you later. about you. so happy to be joining you guys for worship today. We've got our tea and coffee mugs going with us while we worship, so hop on on your feet if you want to dance, or if not, just sit down in your spot and worship with us. Worthy of every song we could ever sing.
question, what is one injustice I've seen in this world today? The first thing that comes to mind is how we tend to treat our earth. I've seen people throw trash out the car window or leave the water on longer than needed. These stuff is so wrong and it's not right for us to treat our earth like that. So simple things such as not serving more than you're going to eat, or saving for leftovers, turning off the water when you're done, and picking up after yourself. It can really help out our earth and make it right. But suddenly Nebuchadnezzar jumped up in amazement and exclaimed to his advisors didn't we tie up three men and throw them into the furnace yes my majesty we certainly did they replied look nebuchadnezzar shouted i see four men up, up un, unbound walking around in the fire unharmed and the fourth one looks like a god then Nebuchadnezzar came as close as he could to the door of the flaming furnace and shouted, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out, come here. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego stopped out of the fire stepped out of the fire then the high officers official go governor and advisors crowded around them and saw that the fire had not touched them not a hair on their head was was singed and their clothing was not scorched. They didn't even smell of smoke. First, let's paint a picture. When I was at elementary school, there were classmates I saw that were pressuring other people into doing things like giving away their materials or playing games that they didn't understand. I didn't know at the time, but what I just experienced is what's known as injustice. Now you may or may not have experienced or seen a similar story to what I shared, but would you agree that the situation I described was unfair? I knew something was wrong. So when we see someone bullied at school for the way they look or talk, that's an injustice. Students who go to sleep hungry or don't have enough to eat, that's also another injustice. Injustices are the kind of things that make us stop and think in a moment that something is not correct. Some of us have seen it, heard it, or even experienced it. And when it comes to this, you don't deserve the injustice that you experienced. All the way back to Adam and Eve, God tells us that we have value because we're made in His image. And because of that, you have value. And nothing will ever change that because you are made to be treated with respect. Those injustices you experienced, they say a lot more about the brokenness and hurt in the people who are putting you in that position than they do about you. Now with that being said, let me tell you about a group of people who have experienced injustice together. In ancient times, there was this crazy king named Nebuchadnezzar who ordered everyone to bow down to his 90 foot tall statue, and if not, they were thrown into a fire. That's pretty harsh, right? Well, there were these three Jewish leaders named Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These guys refused to bow down to the statue and instead chose to worship God. Now, you could probably guess that the king was not very happy with this situation. And then they ordered these three to be sent into the fire. You would probably agree that this is very unfair and they never deserved this. However, things take a turn in this story. When the three leaders came out of the fire, they were completely unharmed. They didn't have any smell of the fire and they were totally untouched. While we don't know who else was in the fire, we do know that God did not allow them to be alone in their situation. And that's a big deal, because it shows us that when you experience injustice, you don't have to face it alone. And you're never alone. God is with you the entire time during any injustice. 
Now let's say you feel like you cause injustices, say by not standing up for a friend or just being a bully. Just because you've been like that before doesn't mean you can't change now. You can change. You can ask God to help you see the places you've participated in injustice and ask him to give you the courage to make it right. And maybe after this, you can be the voice that stands up to injustice when you see it. Hello, Vineyard Kids. Hi, I'm Ashley's father. I'm here to say a prayer for you today. Dear God, let's hope that everyone has a great day and everyone today feels the love that you feel for them. Mm -hmm. And Lord, we have faith in you and we trust you, dear God, in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And Vineyard Kids, remember, always have faith in the Lord. The Lord will always be there for you. Amen. Bye. And that is the end of our service. Thank you so much for joining us. It was so good to have you. I'm so thankful for all of our volunteers. Yeah, super thankful for you guys. We can't wait to hear more from you in the next upcoming weeks. There's good to come. God is doing amazing things in our midst. Mm -hmm. And we're excited just to be in person again as the weeks go on. So I think we're going to have some bloopers coming up. So make sure you stay on to see those. Hello. Hey guys. No. <laughs> I didn't know what to do with my hand. Hi, it's Isabel, and today we're going to be talking about how we could put others first. Um, have you ever heard the phrase, every man for himself? Um, when I hear this phrase, I kind of think about... Um, pause it there, pause it there. And I don't know. What to say. Hi, I'm Isabel, and today we're going to be talking about... What are we talking about? <laughs>